Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a special briefing about how startup accelerators can drive climate action. This briefing is a bonus installment of our series, Scaling Up Innovation to Drive Down Emissions. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we have also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs to help make energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, and renewable energy more accessible and affordable to their customers. ESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. If you would like to make sure you always receive our latest educational resources, just take a minute to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. I hope everyone in our audience today has enjoyed our entire briefing series, Scaling Up Innovation to Drive Down Emissions. We covered a wide range of technologies that, if deployed at scale, would help deliver significant emissions reductions and move us closer to meeting our 2030 climate goals. Our series originally had four installments, green hydrogen, direct air capture, building out electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and offshore wind energy. To review presentation materials and summary notes, visit us online at www.esi.org. But as we neared the completion of the series, we were struck with a little bit of extra inspiration. What about the next generation of technologies? We wanted to make room in our briefing schedule to talk with experts who, on the sharp, who are on the sharpest part of the cutting edge of technologies that will help us meet our climate goals. And specifically, we were curious about the challenges facing researchers and entrepreneurs and the barriers to commercializing new technologies. We were also very interested in the incredible work being done in clean energy laboratories, incubators, accelerators, and fellowship programs, like the Activate Fellowship program we'll hear from today across the country to bring these new technologies to market and ultimately to commercialization. Today's briefing is the first of two bonus installments for our two latest series. On Thursday, as a culmination of our briefing series, Living with Climate Change, which featured panels discussing the polar vortex, sea level rise, wildfires, and extreme heat, we will convene a special session integrating equity into emergency management. You will not want to miss that. I encourage everyone to visit us online and RSVP right away. Part of what separates these bonus briefings from the others is the format. We will only be together today for an hour. Following our two panelists' presentations, I will be joined by my colleague, Savannah Bertrand, who will help us navigate the discussion today. And we've reserved a good portion of the briefing for discussion and questions. And we'll do our best to incorporate questions from our audience. If you have a question, you can send it to us via email. And the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at ESI.org. Or even better, follow us on Twitter, at ESI Online, and send it to us by responding to the live tweeting thread. As always, you can re revisit the entire session by watching the archived webcast online at www.esi.org. And now it's my privilege to introduce the first of our two panelists. Andrew Chang is a mission-driven engineer, entrepreneur, and operator. He supports Activate New York's work, which is focused on carbon tech and climate tech innovation across industries, including agriculture, buildings, chemicals, computing, electricity, manufacturing, and transportation. He served at the U.S. Department of Energy during the Obama administration, where he implemented building energy efficiency programs, seeking to identify new innovations for reducing carbon emissions. Andrew has also led successful entrepreneurial ventures in the U.S. and in Singapore. Andrew, it's great to have you on our panel today. I really couldn't be more looking forward to your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you. So, I'm excited to be here to talk more about Activate and what we're doing. So give me a, a moment to share my screen. All right, here we go. Uh, so I have the pleasure to talk a bit about Activate and what we're doing, as well as some of the innovations that we're really excited about. Uh, first and foremost, Activate is a two-year entrepreneurial fellowship program. Um, we think about ourselves as a fellowship because we invest directly in people, as opposed to investing in the technology or in companies. And that's because at the earliest stage of 
the cycle uh, from spin out and inception of, of technologies. The technologies may change, the markets may change, the company will change, but what uh, stays the same or is consistent is the people. Um, of course, the, the people, the entrepreneurs, the founders actually will get better and better over time as they iterate on their product and understand those markets and ultimately figure out what is the right path to take their technology to market. And so with that, we really focus on eight key industries, uh, some of which Dan has mentioned, most of which um, have a climate angle, whether that be in the electric power sector, long-term energy battery storage, um, agriculture, chemicals, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And to date, we have seeded over 142 Activate Fellows across eight different cohorts. Um, we are structured as a nonprofit. We were founded in 2015, and we have fellowship communities in Berkeley, Boston, New York, and across the U.S. with a new program um, called Anywhere, which is a virtual fellowship program. And our mission, our main objective is to empower scientists to reinvent the world um, by bringing their research to market. And it can be easy to get pessimistic about the state of the world today uh, and our growing, our growing climate crisis. But because of this, I'm a firm believer uh, that we need scientists more than ever before. And uh, we need them because a lot of those hard problems in climate um, have yet to be solved. And we need new technologies, um, some that have yet to be developed, some that are at in infancy uh, to scale and ultimately decarbonize our economy. And I believe that scientists will play a pivotal role in bringing these solutions to market and ultimately helping to make our world more sustainable, resilient, and equitable. And I have one of the best jobs in the world because I get to work with a lot of Activate Fellows, um, such as Garrett, who you'll have a chance to meet later today. And uh, I'll tell you, I've never been more optimistic about our ability to solve and meet these challenges uh, because of the amazing people that are coming into the space, the amazing scientists, entrepreneurs that are really coming and building in the next generation platforms for decarbonization. So how does our Activate Fellowship work? We have three main components. The first is we provide time and funding to allow our early stage science entrepreneurs to understand the market, to test, to iterate, and ultimately figure out and define a, a path forward uh, for, for its product and service, uh, and ultimately secure follow-on financing. In addition, we work with partners to provide world-class tools for our scientists. Um, and that's in two uh, key parts. One is access to research facilities and equipment to help and allow for the maturation of the technologies that are still at the early stages. Um, and we also provide education and mentorship to help our fellows learn new skills. And finally, um, and perhaps maybe the most important is we're building a really um, powerful community of advisors, partners, champions, you know, other scientists and entrepreneurs um, and investors on the harder tech side of the um, entrepreneurial spectrum that can support our fellows. And many of these folks have gone through similar challenges in the past um, and are familiar with the long development cycles or the long learning cycles, uh, as well as the higher um, upfront capital expenses that are indicative of building hard science technology companies. And our fellowship program is a proven path for scientists and entrepreneurs to help really move that breakthrough research into the market. And we give them those two years because it can take time. And we don't do it alone. We work with a lot of key partners that includes government, uh, both at the state and federal levels. Um, that includes our national lab partners, our university partners, um, you know, and our foundation partners. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we also work with a lot of other partners in the innovation ecosystem on the corporate side, on the venture capital side, um, that can help in the continuity of the development cycle of these companies and to help support them as they evolve and grow and scale. And today we have um, supported over 140 Activate Fellows 
that has led to 106 science-based companies, many of which will go on to change the world. And they've cumulatively uh, raised over $860 million in follow-on financing already and, um, and have created over 700 jobs in the US. And um, given some of the webinars that you've had in the past, I thought it would be great to share a couple of different companies in our portfolio, um, starting with Resonant Link, which has come up with a novel um, wireless charging platform that uh, can uh, that is three times more efficient than the traditional wireless charging mechanisms. It's also eight times cheaper, and um, and can be done with uh, a fifty percent um, footprint. Um, and uh, right now they are working on bringing this technology to market in medical devices and implants, but their technology can scale to many other applications, including um, scaling up to uh, help support the electric vehicle um, charge infrastructure. Uh, in addition, we have another company in our portfolio called Entour Energy, and they are helping to decarbonize heavy industry. Uh, with their zero carbon heat and power system. And what they do is they found a really novel and affordable way to store the excess wind and solar electricity during the day um, as thermal storage. And then they can reconvert that um, energy back into electricity um, during times when the, the wind is not blowing and, and, and the sun is not shining. But they can also um, pipe out that heat um, as a industrial grade um, process heat to support a lot of various heavy industries. Um, and so we're really excited about them because they're showing a pathway to decarbonize heavy industries, which um, has typically been um, really difficult to, uh, to, to do and, and understand. And finally, um, we have another company in our portfolio called Tuckachar, and they have built a platform for taking any type of waste biomass and turning it into fertilizer and other uh, high value end use products. And they can do this in a decentralized fashion. They can do this on site and offer new revenue streams to farmers and, and, um, and, and other organizations that can leverage this technology. And I will take a moment to dive a little bit deeper into the Takastar, Takachar journey um, through a case study with how they've been able to leverage our Activate Fellowship and, and really kind of explore the breadth of where this technology can uh, be expressed. And so um, Kevin uh, Kung is the co-founder CTO. Uh, he did his PhD at MIT uh, and really uh, started to generate this technology back when he did his PhD. They were initially exploring agriculture as a end market. And first they were looking at biofuels, um, at turning waste, biomass to biofuels and they realized that um, the biofuel market might not be the right and the best one. So they pivoted, they moved into char and then they moved into fertilizer. And with the Activate Fellowship program, we've been able to help them uh, explore different additional markets as well as different business models to really think about how do they potentially scale this technology and scale this business. Um, and the exciting part is that uh, this technology taking biomass and then converting it into um, fertilizer as a technology platform that can be used in many other applications. Um, so for example, they can use the same technology with of course different treatment conditions and temperatures and such and convert the, the, the waste biomass into additives that can go into concrete and help bring down the carbon intensity of concrete. They are also exploring using this um, as a mixture into plastics and to make um, bioplastic. Um, and additionally, they're also looking at um, this as a replacement for coal in coal-fired power plants. Um, so really excited to see all these different novel uh, pathways that this technology is now uh, can, can express. And the final one, because I, I, I heard that the, this, the webinar series also was touched on the climate impacts, including wildfires. Well, this particular um, uh, company with Takachar, they also now have a partnership with the California Department of Forest Management 
because they can also use this technology to help reduce the potential wildfires in the future. So they've raised $5 million or so in financing so far, mostly in federal, state, government, some philanthropy, and then they were the recipients of the uh, Prince William Earthshot Prize um, last year, and then most recently, uh, about a month ago or so, they were named one of the Elon Musk uh, Carbon Removal X Prize winners. Very excited about this technology, where they started, and where they're going. And and this is not just Takachar, this is many other companies that we have in our portfolio. So uh, uh, as Activate as whole, we think about um, the priorities um, that we can focus on. Uh, First and foremost priority is um, addressing climate change. Um, we think that this is one of the most defining challenges of our time. And we have been encouraged by all of these scientists and entrepreneurs that are stepping up. We know that we need multiple shots on goal. And, um, and we think that our scientists, entrepreneurs are going to be playing a pivotal role in uh, inventing and scaling a lot of the uh, future decarbonization platforms of the future that really get us there to solving the climate crisis and getting to net zero. And also um, in terms of moving carbon dioxide from our atmosphere as well. So um, that's one on climate change. Another one is in the US innovation ecosystem. We think that being here in the US is um, some of the, is the best place in the world for science-based entrepreneurship. Uh, we're continuing to work with partner and, and find additional partners to really help in growing this ecosystem. So it's, uh, so it, uh, and, 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 and lastly, uh, we focus a lot on diversity, equity, inclusion. We think that this is a huge, important opportunity and a big unlock for the US um, in terms of tapping into the brilliant and diverse um, talent pools that we have here of scientists and entrepreneurs. And our goal is to help bring down some of the barriers um, so that everyone, regardless of gender, um, race, ethnicity, location can really participate in the innovation ecosystem. And we don't do this alone. We do this with a network of um, national partners um, that starts with academia, with our national lab and university partners that really provide that backbone for our fellowship, um, as well as government partners, both state and local that um, have that long-term uh, horizon. And then, a lot of companies that are now leaning in to um, working with early stage technology companies, uh, a lot of our uh, activate portfolio companies and, and helping with uh, things like um, uh, pilots and, and figuring out uh, where those decarbonization pathways may present themselves. And then of course, uh, philanthropy that have been um, helping to provide that catalytic funding to support a lot of that um, high risk, high reward research and technology that that we uh, that we invest in. Um, and because of the audience, I would be remiss if I, I didn't spend a little bit of time to talk about how critical it is um, for our government, um, uh, you know, playing a role in supporting our hard tech uh, science entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, and it starts with those early investments by a lot of the federal agencies already, such as the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. Um, which has shown tremendous success uh, in supporting the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, on the hard tech side, including our Activate Fellows. Um, and that's through programs such as the, the NSF i program that has an amazing uh, pipeline of, of, of scientists and, and entrepreneurs, as well as the DOE Lab Embedded uh, Entrepreneurship Program. Um, we're also very encouraged by the new early stage innovation programs that are being discussed right now, such as the National Science Foundation's TIP Directorate, as well as the DOE Foundation, which is currently being proposed in the innovation package. We believe that both of these types of programs can help accelerate the commercialization of early stage technology. And then finally, we also wanted to mention that um, it's important that we preserve a lot of tools that work today um, uh, and, and, and work really well. And one of them is the SBR and STTR grant program, which is currently uh, facing a potential lapse in financing um, and is in danger of expiring if Congress isn't able to um, come up with a compromise by the end of September. Um, and uh, the SBAR grant program is probably one of the primary financing mechanisms for supporting uh, our hard tech science uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem. 
almost every single one of our fellows and portfolio companies apply for these grants. And um, the companies such as Takachar, uh, Resident Link, and Antora Energy that we talked about all were recipients of of these SBR grants. And 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 uh, and I I'm. Uh, some of our companies in our portfolio may not actually exist today if it wasn't for this program. So to summarize, uh, we invest in people. Uh, we provide the education, the time, and the tools for um, our fellows to grow into leaders and company operators. Um, we're also building a community of hard science entrepreneurs, mentors, investors, and alumni, now more and more alumni, which is fantastic that can help provide that guidance to our cohort and help them learn and grow together. And we don't do this alone. Um, we work with partners um, all across the innovation ecosystem that includes state and local government, that includes universities, um, deep tech investors, uh, a lot of corporations and other accelerators and innovation programs that, that can further support the, the arc and trajectory of our companies. Um, so we look our, at ourselves as a bridge from the basic science um, and first experiments to first pilots. And so far we've taken over 140 scientists from zero to one, and we look forward to working with hundreds of, of others to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. That was an awesome presentation. Um, if anyone would like to go back and revisit Andrew's slides, uh, and the same will go for Garrett's slides, um, you can visit us online at www.eesi.org. Uh, and check out um, all of the presentation materials as well as the archived webcast. Um, we are going to go from, Andrew was just talking about going from zero to one, we're going to go from panelist one to panelist two, and that means it's my pleasure to introduce Garrett Boudinot. Garrett is a climate scientist and Activate New York 2022 fellow working to scale up verified land and water-based carbon dioxide removal. Uh, Garrett also serves on the New York State Climate Impacts Assessment. Garrett, welcome to our briefing today. Um, Turn it over to you. Oops, we're having a hard time hearing you, Garrett. I think you might be muted. Oh, oh there it goes, you're better. You can hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay, great, great, thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, so for those of us in the fellowship, we talk all the time about how great Activate uh, is, so I'm really glad to have the opportunity to share uh, more about that with all of y'all today. Uh, I'm going to get into my personal experience and perspective. Hopefully that will illuminate some of the um, kind of details of what Andrew was just outlining from a, a higher up point of view, um, particularly some of the struggles that we kind of early stage science entrepreneurs face and some of the existing resources uh, that are there, some of the existing successes that we can benefit from and most notably activate being uh, uh, one of the champions of those. Um, and I do want to nuance that my perspective um, is unique. I'm only six weeks into the Activate Fellowship. Uh, as Andrew said, it's a two-year fellowship. So certainly there's a lot of benefits from Activate that, I've yet, that I'm, I'm yet to see and uh, challenges to entrepreneurship broadly that I've yet to see. Um, but also I think given how close I am to still emerging from academia, from a research uh, only position into this entrepreneurship, uh, I think I'm particularly aware of how important a fellowship like Activate is for those of us very early stage getting off the ground and, and bringing our research to market. So here's a bit of my story, what led me to Activate, and then I'll also go into some of the specific resources Activate's provided um, that have really been helpful for me at this early stage. Um, so. My background, as Dan said, is in climate science and specifically geochemistry. So using analytical chemistry tools to probe the environment and really understand uh, in my earliest days, how is the climate changing? And then how is that impacting uh, people and ecosystems? So I've studied everything from sea level rise, ocean acidification, forest fires, warming, carbon cycle, really getting into the weeds on the problem. And that culminated into my PhD at University of Colorado Boulder. Again, really into analytical chemistry to answer these broad questions about the extent of the problem. And just a, a personal decision for me was, okay, now I'm going to take these skills and focus on solutions. And so I joined a research program here at Cornell, 
um, where I focused on carbon dioxide removal research, so that's the CDR, in agriculture specifically. And Cornell, a great place to do that as a land-grant institute, and really looking at how does it work? What does it take to facilitate carbon dioxide removal in uh, an industry like agriculture to kind of uh, follow through on the promises that we're hearing about the potential climate solutions from agriculture? But then thinking as a scientist, what are some of the challenges that the market might face in actually verifying that there is carbon dioxide removal? And then how does that translate into practice? Um, and it was through that that I started thinking, well, the, the, this, this cartoon illustrates uh, some of my thinking. So uh, this is a meme, uh, essentially modification of a cartoon some people sitting around a campfire in a post-apocalyptic world. One of them saying, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created lots of research we didn't act on. This summarizes where I, I was um, thinking in doing some of that research on carbon dioxide removal solutions. Okay, it's great to do the research, but there's a big leap between that and actually uh, bringing that into a solution for our climate. And that's really what I'm passionate about. And so I started thinking about my research less in terms of um, scientific questions and more in terms of solutions that could be brought to market. And so I started engaging in some existing resources that were available to me as a researcher at Cornell. One of those was the National Science Foundation's Innovation Corps, or i -Corps. And Andrew mentioned that um, I took the regional course there. It's a four week, um, several hours a week where you're, as a scientist, taught some of the principles of um, a, a uh, business plan, uh, but also uh, some of the principles of market research. So you actually start talking to potential customers, uh, different potential partners to think, how could my technology or research actually play out in, into economies of scale? And I want to highlight that was really helpful. Um, that was something that it, it, it was only four weeks, it felt like a second PhD in terms of being given a whole new set of skills that can then apply uh, moving forward. There were also a number of resources in uh, Cornell and that are available at academic institutions that I want to highlight. So um, EIRs, Entrepreneurs in Residence, are, are common and I was able to connect with a few of those at Cornell who are part of different incubators. Um, and their job is as folks with experience in entrepreneurship to provide advice and mentorship to uh, researchers thinking about commercialization. And again, that was incredibly helpful. Um, this is, in my capacity, it was generally informal and then it can become as formal as you'd like it, uh, depending on how involved you get in these different incubators. But that was something I want to highlight and then working with uh, the actual tech transfer office at Cornell to start thinking about issues of IP, issues of the kind of the, the technical side of bringing research to market. That was another resource that was really helpful. But those were kind of all of the resources that I had available. I felt like I had really exhausted um, the institutional resources that were there. And then it started getting into informal phone calls with people that I thought might have some insight, really recognized, okay, I need some formal support um, because as a scientist, I have not been trained in any of this entrepreneurship. And so that's when um, it was actually out of the NSF I Corps, one of my instructors, uh, the day that that course concluded, sent me the information about Activate. Um, that highlights how important that networking aspect is of having folks who are in the know. There was no um, activate uh, poster in the hallways at Cornell to, to um, let folks know about it, but I, I was turned on to it and um, went through the application process there. And, and even before being accepted as a fellow, there were uh, many weeks of putting together pitches, working with folks in the activate network, just uh, and most importantly, Andrew, just to get through, um, okay, we recognize you're a researcher. Now we're asking you to think as an entrepreneur, here are some ways that you can improve that even before you're a fellow. I found that incredibly helpful and it just highlights, um, again, all of the 
um, the resources that Activate provides and the need from my end and from a researcher's perspective to get there. So thinking about how Activate helps scientists scale up climate solutions, there are, are kind of two aspects of what Andrew highlighted that I want to underscore here. So particularly at this early phase that I'm in, there's just a transition from an academic or research focused perspective, culture, goal, objective to those of entrepreneurship and of business that um, Activate is that I feel um, necessary for facilitating that transition. And so, as Andrew said, a lot of us early fellows, we have an idea, we maybe have some data or a concept, um, but we're motivated to bring that to uh, the market, to actually have solutions, have an impact, bring that to economies of scale. And there's a big bridge there that Activate helps us build and even more specifically into just building a company, there's a lot that goes into that. And as Andrew said, I mean, we as fellows, as scientists are the lead entrepreneurs, are often the executives of these startup companies, but we did not have training in that. Um, and so going, ha having access to mentorship resources on the legal side of that, some of the uh, corporate side of that, even the, the cultural aspects of building a company that are really important, but often, you know, overlooked if you're, if you're just going to a boot camp. Um, these are all things that Activate provides. And I, I think the most useful tool that Activate provides through that is this training, this mentorship, this advising. And so that comes everything from uh, several times a week, we have formal coursework to actually having just a, a really informal network of experts, entrepreneurs, and mentors to, to call upon whenever we need them. And I imagine Andrew's smiling behind the camera there because he, he knows when I come into a problem, I can call him anytime and we can talk through things. And as someone taking a big step out into the, into the abyss, that's incredibly important. And so some of the things that we are able to, to get that um, training and guidance on are things like fundraising for research and development, but also for scaling, um, thinking about strategic partnerships and advising um, outside of the Activate network. So whether that's Activate helping uh, connect us to folks or just turning us on to what we should be looking for. Of course, the, the kind of uh, bread and butter of entrepreneurship, these business model, identifying value proposition, thinking about product market fit. Again, None of this you'll find in a geochemistry textbook. Uh, and so all stuff that's really helpful to have. Uh, and then I really want to underscore, you know, Andrew said this a number of times that uh, Activate invests in the person, not the idea. And that is so critical for those of us in this early stage who, sure, we've done NSFI core, we've done some market development, but as our, our technology develops and as the world around us changes and as we learn more about that world, having the freedom to be able to pivot in this early stage and that not impact um, our fellowship or our future opportunities and that actually empower us to then take a more educated step forward into a different direction is absolutely critical and I've, I've really benefited from that. And it's worth mentioning that as Andrew said, none of this is done alone. So this is all complementary to the other training, advising, incubators, entrepreneurs and residents that I can, at, can get. And I really feel um, encouraged to seek out as many resources as possible. Um, so those are some of the, the really helpful things. And then I just wanna conclude with highlighting the Activate New York cohort that Andrew um, is the managing director of. So it's myself and five other, uh, five or six other fellows all focused on carbon dioxide removal. So all focused on this overall goal of accelerating uh, emissions reductions. And what's really critical about that is uh, we have in New York City an ecosystem of, yes, there's some state policy and local and national policy momentum that we can build on that's focused on New York City, but also outside of that policy from um, other startups in the area that can be partners um, or examples, uh, a lot of climate tech incubation, a lot of investors who are focused on this all in that New York City ecosystem 
that's really been helpful. Um, and then uh, one of the hardest things for those of us in uh, climate tech world generally, particularly carbon dioxide removal even more so, is that this is an incredibly nascent field. And so if I'm looking for a mentor um, who's gone through a successful company or two in my field, I'm just not going to find one because this is such a new field of carbon dioxide removal. It also means it's constantly changing. Um, so there are new ways that the market can unfold today that weren't, uh, that, that we didn't foresee even six months ago. And so having this intense support guidance, the network, and even a cohort of other fellows going through the same thing is, is really important. And I think, uh, you know, the, the two words that I uh, keep going back to when I think about what Activate does is supporting and empowering. Uh, which for those of us scientists who are on a mission to uh, help drive down emissions or remove carbon dioxide, we've got the tech, we've got the science, what we really need is the entrepreneurial support and uh, the empowerment that uh, our mentors, the network, and that training provides. Uh, so that's it from me. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity and, and looking forward to the questions. Thanks, Garrett. That was an awesome presentation. Um, one quick reminder to folks in our audience, if you have a question for our panelists, you can send us an email and the email address to use is ask at esi.org. That's A-S-K at esi.org. You can always also follow us online on Twitter at ESI online and ask us a question that way. Speaking of questions, I'm going to introduce my colleague Savannah. Savannah is a policy associate here at ESI and was a big part of pulling um, not just today's briefing together, but basically all of the briefings we've done in this series together. So she's joining me today to help us uh, to, to lead us through the discussion. So Savannah, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Dan. And wonderful presentations, Andrew and Garrett. I learned so much. Um, so my first question is, why are university researchers uniquely suited to participate in a fellowship program like Activate's? And what makes the Activate Fellowship unique to help overcome barriers to commercialization that are fre frequently encountered by university researchers? Great, and I'm I'll happy to- that first to Andrew, yeah, thank Okay, you. yeah, I'm happy to kick that off and then Garrett, feel free to fill in any uh, particular details. Um, but firstly, I, I would probably take a step back and say that um, higher level, um, our goal with um, this fellowship program is to help empower uh, technical scientists uh, and help them transform into entrepreneurs because we fundamentally believe that their research can really have a um, huge impact on the world. Um, and in, in this case, really help to find those decarbon and build those decarbonization platforms of the future. Um, and, and, um, and we, We've designed this so that uh, we can, which we have with over 140 fellows now, shown that this can be done by technical founders and scientists, um, and it's not just limited to let's say MBAs and uh, uh, you know that are uh, the ones that traditionally start start um, start companies, um, but also on on the research front, I would say that um, a lot of the these technology companies that we work with on the hard sciences really require a deep understanding of the technical uh, pieces. Um, and a lot of researchers um, uh, you know, have spent years becoming the world expert in this particular um, uh, piece of technology um, and are usually the best position to then help express that technology into the world. And we as Activate, we really help them figure out, okay, what is that path to figure out how to best express that technology? As, as you heard from Gary, he spent years and years and years as, as, as a researcher, uh, studying climate from multiple angles as a geochemist and, and, and now you know, looking at various things in, 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 in agriculture and other areas. And so we really think about it from, from that perspective. Um, Garrett, do you wanna mention anything else? This question is there's even a, a paradigm that this question has that I think is challenged by a lot of folks. I think there are some folks who would, who would say researchers are uniquely unsuited for entrepreneurship. And, and even in my experience with, you know, when, when I was first kind of exploring this idea and would go to um, some of the existing institutional resources, the first thing that I was told is, oh, we'll find you a CEO. 
we'll find you something who will take care of that because you're a researcher. This isn't, you know, stay in your lane. And I think what Activate has shown is that's absolutely not the case. And what Andrew just said of researchers knowing their tech best, knowing the ecosystem that it's in best, and thus having a unique, or bringing a unique asset to the, the company that that can build um, is something that, uh, that's why I think the word empowering comes up so much when I think about Activate. It was by looking at Activate's former fellows, looking at act, the, the companies that have come out to Activate, for me to actually see in myself, oh, even though I've never gotten this training, even though I don't have an MBA, this is actually something that uh, I can learn how to do and be successful at. So that, that's the, the biggest thing for me. You know, all, all of the, the training that I've gotten is still useful for commercialization. Now it's activate filling in those gaps and providing the support for me to make it happen. Great. And so what partnerships and collaborations have come um, about as a result of Activate's fellowship program and how have these spurred further innovation to advance climate solutions? And maybe Garrett, we'll start with you this time. Absolutely, so it's relatively early for me and even we had an orientation um, back in early June where uh, within a week after the orientation I had over a dozen emails from potential partners, potential investors, uh, government agencies, folks really uh, interested in the work and saying, how can we help? How can we be supportive? And that um, in and of itself was, um, again, in like the first week, like, okay, we're, we're here, we're, um, we're making it happen. And so some of those were potential partners. They were folks uh, or, or industry uh, partners who said, hey, I'm working in this area. I think I can, you know, I'm interested in some of the value that uh, your idea could provide to what we're doing. Some of them were investors saying, hey, we think you would fit well in our portfolio, or we think we could uh, provide some, some insight and resources that would be helpful. Um, and some of them were, you know, potential advisors, folks who said, you know, I've worked in this area for a while. I'm looking for something new. I'd love to just be a resource for you. Uh, and again, that was like first couple of weeks. I'm sure Andrew can speak to some of the, the longer term uh, opportunities here as well. Yeah, sure. I, I would just say, come talk to us in a year because Activate New York is only six weeks old. Um, there is, I, based on just the velocity right now and speed that all of our fellows are working in, there's going to... Um, I'm not, I'm, there's going to be so many um, exciting stories to share about the collaborations um, within Activate New York and, and the new opportunities that will play out in, in, the, in the future. Um, I can talk about a couple companies that, uh, you know, going back to the initial presentation where we talked about Takachar, for example, um, they started off in the agricultural space looking at biofuels and then moving to biochar and then fertilizer. And it was through the Activate Fellowship program where they started to ex explore different new markets and opportunities. And one of them through the Activate Fellowship program led to a partnership with uh, California and the Department of Forestry around how do we use this technology to enforce management, you know, and help reduce the potential wildfires in the future and also create a new revenue stream for the, for, for the, the, the uh, for the forestry department. Um, so that's ongoing. They also have now a pilot, I believe, with uh, PG&E, uh, you know, the, the big utility uh, company there too, uh, because there is that um, interface between the, the electric power sector and, uh, uh, and with the, the, the high voltage transmission lines. And, 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 uh, and, and, the, um, and so we're excited to see what they do and accomplish there. And then the other company that I can also speak briefly about that uh, other company, Antura Energy, um, they uh, that are working on decarbonizing the in heavy industry space. They actually came in as two separate companies um, in Activate. They met in Activate and they realized that there are synergies in their technologies as well as their values and alignment. They decided to merge, you know, and since then the rest is history. They've just raised, I think, over $70 million, you know, and are working on their first pilot plant right now. So um, we have a lot of success stories um, you know, uh, it, within our e Activate ecosystem and then so many more to come in, in the next year with Activate New York. Sounds like really interesting stuff is coming towards both of you. That's awesome. 
Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan for a couple of his questions. It sounds like, Andrew, you're trying to tee up another briefing next year at about this time, which you never know. There might be something to that. Um, but I have a question sort of just to help our audience sort of understand what the sort of the potential is here. And I'm curious, and Andrew, maybe we'll start with you this time and then we'll hear from Garrett. But what's the ceiling for all of this? Like, how high could this go? What's the potential ceiling for clean tech and carbon tech? to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. And I think I'm also curious once we sort of define what that ceiling is, and I have a hunch I know what the answer is, but how do we do a better job enabling more organizations like Activate, enabling more researchers and entrepreneurs like Garrett? How do we, be, how do, we do a better job allowing these technologies and supporting these technologies to, to reach scale? That is a really, really good uh, question. Let me ask, answer the first part. Um, first, I think that uh, with regard to um, a limit, I don't think there is a limit. I think that every day, you know, I just get so inspired by a lot of the work and innovation that is being developed right now by scientists all around uh, the world. The, there are so many um, really talented people now moving into climate um, and working on these new decarbonization technologies that didn't exist a couple of years ago. And we never even realized the connection potentially to um, how that can help um, uh, you know, uh, address our climate crisis. Um, and I've been in the climate space since uh, for 15 years now. And, and you know, back then there wasn't anything like carbon removal, you know, all of these types of things. And carbon removal is only a couple of years uh, right now and the velocity and the speed in terms of um, how fast some of these technologies are moving is just incredible. Um, I will also say that um, you know, we are learning a lot from our fellows because um, they have really unique insights on the world uh, through the lens of their technology and where they can see that technology, you know, having a massive uh, opportunity to unlock for, uh, for uh, creating a better world. Um, and I, I will say that in terms of, you know, what are some of the barriers here, uh, you know, there's... Uh, there are barriers like, let's say on the policy side, although on the state, yeah, you know, there, there has been, uh, we're in New York. And so there's been a, a lot of um, uh, local leadership, both at the state level and at the city level that is encouraging a lot of really interesting and exciting um, climate uh, companies. And, and we're, at, we're also just, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of climate companies moving to New York right now and starting businesses here because this is one of the, um, um, uh, 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 ecosystems that's really supporting um, this this growth, and uh, but there are still barriers, and one of them I would say uh, from where we sit is there's uh, about fifty billion dollars a year that go into basic science research, um, and really just a fraction of that goes into the commercialization piece, you know, and so if there was a magic wand, it, it would be to um, get additional uh, financing mechanisms to really help fill that gap uh, from basic science to commercialization. Again, as someone who's trying to, to scale up in this space of just how nascent the field is. I mean, it's, I, I know folks use the analogy of like flying a plane while you build it for any company but it feels like flying a plane while building it, while building the atmosphere uh, for this climate tech um, field specifically, because it's, so, it's still developing. It, and I think I said this earlier, the field now and, and the opportunities that are available weren't, we didn't foresee them six months ago, let alone two years ago. And so being in that space and trying to plan what a company is going to look like in two years, or what the technology field overall will be able to provide and scale up in two years is really difficult. But the good news is we are seeing, uh, one, one of the, the clear trends is a lot of funding going into this across the board in kind of climate tech broadly. And I think that's something that wasn't there five years ago has really accelerated and that's really empowering. And I think from the, you know, from federal and state, uh, particularly here in New York with uh, some of the uh, state legislation that's been passed and in focus here. There's a lot of top-down um, incentives for this. And so NYSERDA, um, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority is a partner with um, Activate New York. So that highlights some of the resources 
helping there. Uh, but then at the federal level, uh, ARPA-E, DOE has been putting a lot, uh, which helps guide how companies uh, think about this moving forward and, and USDA as well. Um, I think from the, the market overall, top-down policies on how, again, me thinking in terms of carbon dioxide removal specifically, there's just so many, the, the, the phrase that comes up with this is we're still in the wild west. And so having some top-down policies to, to prescribe how things should be done will really help accelerate that world. Um, but then that field specific help, like I mentioned with Activate, having a cohort specifically on this or some of the other um, folks in this industry. So uh, Climate Tech VC, for example, as a resource for folks to go to see um, kind of from a, a, a holistic perspective on what's going on in this market is all really helpful to, to fill that gap of what we need to be doing to, to scale up. Savannah, back to you. Thanks so much. That was a great answer. Um, so maybe Andrew can take the first stab at this question, but how does Activate measure the success of its fellows, whether it be emissions reductions or dollars or maybe something else? And Garrett, um, you know, how are you measuring your own success through this fellowship? Oh, okay. This is a good question. Um, there's a couple of different answers to, to, uh, to, to, to talk through. Here at the highest level, uh, we when we look for um, Activate Fellows, uh, we do look for uh, um, well how this technology can scale and what is that potential, um, uh, you know, carbon dioxide removal potential in 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 you know in 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 this case. Uh, a lot of what we do is really looking at okay, can we get to that 500 million half gigaton one gigaton scale um, in the future and of course at what time scale so we are looking at greenhouse gas emissions at the, over the long term the uh, it takes time to build these businesses uh, years decades and so it so um, time uh, uh, so on over the long arc we do look at those metrics we also look at things like um, follow-on financing um, you know um, jobs created and, and so on and so forth uh, we, you know, but there's also this opportunity to, to understand how are these industries evolving? How, how do they reinvent themselves uh, as, as we move into like some of these carbon utilization pieces? Because there's, there's a whole new uh, industry that's really kind of forming. Once you have CO2, you can convert that into other fuels. You can convert that into uh, other chemicals. You can convert it into other plastics. And so there's just a whole new industry that's starting to come up and, 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 and form. And then, you know, and, and that's really the exciting part how, um, in the longer term. Um, and then in the shorter term, one of the things, and this, this will be, a, a, love to hear how, how Garrett thinks about this, is we also look at, uh, with each individual fellow and um, entrepreneur, how do they define success? Um, where do they see their arc going? Because some companies are at wildly different stages. Some are at very early, early, early um, development, others are closer to commercialization. And so um, how do they look at that? And then how do we then figure out a path to supporting them to help them achieve those goals? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, my North Star is emissions reductions, is, is climate impact. And so for, for me, success is I'm having a contribution to overall reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And Functionally, I think that means having a product that's to market, however, however that product is defined. Um, but that that's certainly the the top line measurement of my success. But you know, Andrew also mentioned um, job creation, and I do think that's something that's a a big motivation for me, or a huge opportunity that I see from this type of industry development. We talk all the time about the opportunity in this sector for green jobs creation. And in seeing other fellows or other companies have come through Activate actually being the, um, the catalyst for green jobs creation, seeing my own company as a, a potential green jobs creator is actually one of the things that is, makes, makes me really hopeful about the future and is also tied to that, that success that yes, we're having an impact on our climate, but that's coming with the impacts to society that we know 
climate action can bring. That's a great answer. Thanks so much. I'm going to turn it back over to Dan for one last question. Thanks, Savannah. Um, so, Andrew, in your answer, you were talking about the arcs that each one of your fellows has and the companies has. And um, I'm going to, my last question is, I'm going to ask both of you to define or imagine what you would like your arc to be. It's a question we've asked a lot of panelists in this briefing series, and it's to help our audience imagine sort of what July 12th, 2032 looks like. So Andrew, for you, what's your 10 year vision for Activate? What would you like to see happening 10 years from now? And Garrett, where do you see your arc? Where do you see your technology, your job growth potential? How many employees do you have? Um, what's your what's your vision for sort of that 10 year horizon? And Andrew, maybe we'll start with you once again. Sure. Um, you know, Garrett said his North Star is uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, our North Star at Activate is supporting our fellows, figuring out how they define success and and finding more fellows like Garrett, um, you know, uh, because we are inspired every day by the work that they do. Um, and so with Activate, our goal in the next five years is to try to get to 100 fellows per year. Right now we're about 40, so we're 40% of the way there. Um, and uh, in terms of that uh, fellow mix and expanding access to innovation, um, we want to support as diverse a cohort as possible. Um, that includes um, the technology, that includes on the geography, on the gender, on the race, ethnicity, culture. You know, we want to support everyone. Um, we believe that, um, that this can be a huge unlock for the U.S. and for the world. Um, and in addition to that, help us get to those multiple shots on goal that we need to um, help our world decarbonize. And, um, and over that arc, hopefully as we follow some of these alumni um, over those, the, the, the company building process, uh, many of them hopefully will turn into really large pillars of decarbonization that the world will need um, as we transition to that sustainable economy. I mean, I think, you know, in 10 years, seeing my technology being a critical component, a key to the ecosystem of carbon dioxide removal projects around the world, right? And so that's providing a service to folks who want to create carbon dioxide removal, folks who want to buy offsets or insets or um, carbon dioxide removal as a, a project. Um, and in kind of empowering that, having moved the market forward. So, so for me, you know, verification, having, having scientific um, or, or reliable science behind the climate impact and being able to actually measure that, improve that is really important. If the overall carbon dioxide removal market moves in that direction with my technology being in there, that will be a huge success for me. Dan, I, I know you, you, you mentioned in terms of numbers of green jobs, I'm not sure I have a good, you know, again, just six weeks into the program. So maybe in a year I'll have a better answer. But for me, I'm even thinking of, yes, there's the direct employees of what my, who my company will hire to help create this, but there's also just the economic impact that a sector like carbon dioxide can remove, removal can provide to employees or workers across sectors that's something that's really exciting for me and something that I, I hope to see my company having played a role in empowering a full, again, a full ecosystem of carbon dioxide removal. Thanks, Garrett. And I noticed that you put another little plug in there for coming back a year from now and maybe doing another briefing about how things are going. So noted. Um, this was an awesome panel. Andrew and Garrett, thank you so much for being really tremendous panelists. Um, and anyone in our audience would like to go back and revisit the presentation materials, everything's available online at www.esi.org. You can also go back and watch the webcast. It'll be up probably pretty soon, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, but it'll be up pretty soon. And we'll have some written summary notes as well. But Andrew and Garrett, thanks. Every once in a while, I'll give a little peek into what the um, internal ESI Slack channel is saying about the briefing. And I think one of the key words is hopefulness. 
um, that um, there's just so much potential at Activate and um, um, in all the work that the fellows are doing. So just congratulations on all of that. And Garrett, to you, congratulations on your fellowship and good luck. Maybe we'll be back in touch. That would be really nice. Um, Savannah, thank you for so adeptly leading our discussion today. It's always great uh, to have one of the other members of the ESI team join me um, on uh, one of these briefings. So thanks so much for that and all of your work um, and for all of these briefings. Um, I have two quick plugs. Um, wouldn't be the wrap up of an ESI briefing without plugs. The first is we will be back on Thursday at noon Eastern for um, the bonus briefing in our Living with Climate Change series. That special session is called Integrating Equity into Emergency Management. It will be awesome. And so I encourage everyone to come back, RSVP if you haven't, so you get all of the follow up materials. But that will be really good. And then just within two weeks, on Monday, July 25th, uh, we will be having the 2020 uh, Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. Um, this will be, uh, uh, we'll have four panels. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, the infrastructure bill and infrastructure policy from all sorts of different angles, buildings, workforce, transportation. We'll also be talking about national security, energy security, energy independence. We have an amazing lineup of panelists. I hope everyone will come join us uh, for that on the afternoon uh, of July 25th. Be a really good show and really excited about it. Um, I'd also like to thank the other members of the ESI team who helped make today possible. That includes Dan O'Brien, Omri, Emma, Allison, Anna, and Molly. And of course, once again, thank you, Savannah. We also have four awesome summer interns, Christina, Stephanie, Abby, and Nathan, and they're very busy behind the scenes with um, all of the different stuff that makes these things possible. So, so thanks again for that. My colleague, Dan O'Brien, just put a slide up this is a link to a survey. If folks in our audience have two minutes to take our survey, we really appreciate it. We read every response after every briefing. If you had any audio problems, video problems, problems with the website, if you have ideas for future sessions, please let us know how we did and we'll do our best to improve going forward. We're a couple minutes over. Hope everyone had a great uh, briefing today. I know I learned so much about the right way to encourage researchers and entrepreneurs uh, to um, uh, do what they need to do to get their companies off the ground and at scale. So once again, thanks to Andrew and Garrett, and we'll see everybody back on Thursday for integrating equity into emergency management. Thanks so much.